Hello, welcome to the Litmus Test. I am Phil Moore. This is our first ever episode, the Litmus Test, the show for the creative community. We're going to have multiple episodes. We're going to have discussions about the arts in general. Today, we're focusing on how do you make money as an artist. But first, before we get into stuff, we're going to kick off with a song with the Rhythm Hunters. So please welcome the Rhythm Hunters. Mau purwe do ayai, pata di ondo la di ondo si buruang balang. Ayai, pata di ondo la di ondo si buruang balang.
Now that's how you start a show. We're going to have more of the Rhythm Hunters later in the show, but for now, thank you very much, the Rhythm Hunters. <laughs> we're going to slow things down just a little bit now, and we're going to have what's happening in arts news for this past month or so. So here's the news of the month. In the lead up to the recent state election, both major parties promised significant investment in the Central Coast region, including $12 million toward the proposed Gosford Regional Arts Centre. 10 million of that will go to the centre itself, and 2 million would be the, for the accompanying music conservatorium. Total cost for the centre is estimated at $30 million. Now, we're not about to get into the politics of this. This is about the centre itself. The proposed design will have a 1,000-seat auditorium plus a 200-seat studio. It will also house teaching and rehearsal facilities for the conservatorium and another 150-seat performance space. It will be located on the Gosford waterfront. Now, this project's been on the drawing board for several years now, and with the promise of state government investment, let's hope the development begins soon. Phil. Thanks, Pete. Meanwhile, Wyle and Shire has forged ahead with their own centre called the Art House. Uh, smaller in scale, uh, but they're still ambitious. It is currently under construction and is expected to be completed by the end of the year. It will offer a 500-seat auditorium, 130-seat studio space, uh, and meeting rooms and exhibition centre. Pete. UK arts analyst John Kiefer warns that Australia could be headed for a British-style funding crunch. In an article featured on Art Hub recently, he explains how the funding to the arts in Britain nosedived after the David Cameron government was elected in 2010. A recent report card here by the National Campaign for Arts warned that, and I quote, we have now reached a tipping point where further costs to funding will be permanently damaging the sector, uh, permanently damaging how the sector itself, being the arts, supports society. Kiefer was in Australia recently in an attempt to provoke a discussion that will challenge traditional assumptions about the sustainability, resilience and relevance of the arts. In speaking about how Quebec have approached arts funding, he says, this notion that there's a continuum from not-for-profit arts organisations through to something that's very commercial is interesting, rather than saying it's one world or the other. If you'd like to read the full article and perhaps make more sense of it than I have, artshub.com.au. A few months ago, CCUP, who are producing this show, uh, we made a proposal to Gosford Council about a study into making the region, the Central Coast region, more film-friendly. That is, ways to promote and foster film and TV production here on the Central Coast. Well, that study, that report has now been delivered and the verdict is essentially to do nothing. It spoke to three industry practitioners of various kinds, a CCUP was not among them, and the study's conclusion was it's not worth investing in something that no one really wants or needs. I think they'd rather miss the point. <laughs> To end on a rather happier note, the New South Wales Young Regional Arts Scholarship are open for entries until the 11th of June. Scholarships are available for people aged 18 to 25 who are resident in New South Wales, regional New South Wales in particular. Scholarships will fund activities such as mentorships or internships, residency, short-term courses and workshops, travel and the creation of new work. Applications are open to artists, performers and arts workers across all art forms, so if that's you, go to arts newsouthwales.gov.au and search for Young Regional Artist Scholarships. And thank you, Peter Healy. Thank you. Um, now, this show is primarily about, as an artist, how do you make money? How do you make a living as an artist in the modern world? And we're going to have a discussion panel here very soon discussing this very topic. But first, we put together a package uh, interviewing several people talking about how they make a living or not in the arts. We all know creative people. Here on the coast, there are thousands of them. But do they earn a living? And if so, how? Let's have a listen to what some of these artists have got to say. It's hard to make money out of music anywhere. Okay. Uh, I spent uh, about three months last year in Austin, Texas, and it's, they claim that that's the music city of the world. But even there, it's hard to make a living out of it. It's, sure. you, they rely on tips over there a lot of them okay, uh, you yeah. know they're playing for tips yeah. and um, some if you if you're really good then the tips are really good i guess how does this uh, sit in with the the change of nature of digital recording and sharing mm -hmm. and downloading and all the things that happen 
I think I sell more on iTunes now than I do um, right. okay. in a gig situation, which is sort of cool, you know. You can be right here in your hometown yeah, yeah. and run a career now. It's nice to get out on the road and tour. You've got to remember that it's hard and it's hard to make money out of it. It's no good of driving from here to Brisbane and having gigs, but getting home and finding you've spent more money than you made. I've done it. It's, it's, um, it wears a little thin very quickly. So you've got to make it work. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of selling your work and making it economical for you? Well, as I, as I explained, I do have an, a, an agent who's, who sells my work and also um, can get me commission work. But I also make sure that I'm sort of in exhibitions myself too. I'm usually pretty lucky, you know, to sell a few works and that sort of keeps me going as well. I can't just rely on, on the agent's money rolling in. And also, the other thing, something that has changed that we've noticed in the last few years is galleries are not selling the way they used to sell. A lot of galleries have closed down, including galleries that I've been in. Working as an artist on the coast is a little bit challenging in the way it's hard to make a name for yourself in the bigger market of Sydney. Uh, I think as an artist you have to find your little niche in the market. Leisha, tell us a little bit about what you started uh, with Catherine and how it all evolved, please. Yeah. Well, the, the mission was to, to, um, to set up a, a space, a cultural hub, um, for professional artists, um, to give them an affordable space to work in, an affordable space to exhibit and teach, um, and the networking opportunities that come from here. Working with, on a grassroots level, with people of like mind, and almost like a bartering of skills systems to make things happen without needing a lot of money. So it's, it's a beautiful, um, holistic, uh, plan that's quite a different way of thinking for most people. Right from the beginning with our business plan we did a bit of research on um, where Gosford was intending through council and everything and seeing that they had this cultural plan of making Gosford a cultural hub. Right. So we sort of thought yep yeah, this is where we're going to be, we want to be there you know as they're developing this as well sure. and uh, to be honest the Central Coast does need, need something. Um, to, to attract tourism and um, and there's so many artists that live on the coast that travel to Sydney and the people that have never been in a gallery are feeling welcome to come in here and uh, we're not going to make any judgments, we're not going to be the snooty gallery sort of people, it's, it's open to everybody so we want to talk about the work, we want them to come into the studios and meet the artists and see what's involved in making the art and why it costs what it does, so they can appreciate um, what, what we do and how we add to the world. I'd love to be making a living out of my passion, but, but at this stage, uh, we've, we're only starting up. And I, I guess we'd all like to be able to um, make more money out of that. But at this point in time, we're just keen to get a space and to seek grants to, to um, uh, enable us to run workshops to mm. encourage more people to participate in the arts. You've just got to be brave. And just do it. <laughs> if you believe enough in it, just do it. Put yourself out there. There's nothing to stop you. It's, it's just sheer belief in yourself. And if you want to do it, you can do it. Welcome back. So now I'm joined by our panel of experts. I have to my left here, Keith Wellen. Hello, Keith. Hello. Uh, Keith is the grants guy. So you run a business designed to help anyone apply for and win grants of all kinds. You've worked in local government, uh, universities, sporting and disability sectors, and you run the grant writing workshops for business and community groups, and on behalf of federal politicians. Uh, so welcome, Keith. Thank you. Uh, next to you, you have Glenn McKimmon. Glenn is a multi-award winning photographer and teacher. He runs regular workshops through his education business photo workshops and also runs a successful printing and framing <coughs> company, Credit for Life, and you have a gallery of modern art as well called... Got the Shot. Not, sorry? Got the Shot. Got the Shot. Yeah. Um, and you also happen to be nephew of world-renowned landscape photographer, Ken Duncan. Uh, and you've travelled the world with him, learning what it takes to capture beautiful moments in time. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you. 
Uh, Jessica Gledhill joins us. Jessica is an artist and a teacher, trained at Sydney College of the Arts, and has worked as a curator and gallery administrator at Newcastle Art School. She's currently president of the Creative Workshop Central Coast, an art association committed to promoting art, design and crafts on the Central Coast. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Um, next to me here is David Key. Hi there. And David's been an advertising and marketing consultant for almost 30 years in the UK and here in Australia. He has a keen interest in all arts, culture and believes that creativity is one of the key driving forces uh, in the modern world. You've worked for SBS, uh, the Sydney Film Festival and the Art Gallery of New South Wales, as well as many smaller galleries and creative yeah. projects. And you're handling the marketing for the litmus test. Indeed I am. Welcome David. And to the end here we have Dorian Mode. Hello Dorian. Hey Phil. Dorian's a multi-award winning jazz uh, pianist and author with two comic novels and several short stories published so far on Penguin. He's written features for The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, among others. Uh, you've won the ABC Music Award several times uh, for different things. And you're also head of jazz at the Central Coast Conservatorium for nine years. Was. And, yeah, and most recently you created the Bogan Song Cycle, which you're currently touring around the coast. Yes, it's an a appalling show, show but it's going well. Vitally important. It's a show which you are performing right now, and in fact we have an excerpt from that show which we'll show you right now. Let's have a look at the Bogan Song Cycle. The broken glass sparkles a spot of puddle The sweep of you, my dearly winds The smell of burning wheelie bins the rock riser glazed with tears today, but is it love or pepper spray? I'd take you far away. So that's Dorian in action there. If you want to see the whole show, we'll give you the dates and everything uh, towards the end. <laughs> that looks fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, I got you all to bring a little random relic with you. So Keith, what did you bring along? This should be something that represents <laughs> um, why you got involved and interested in the art in the first place. <laughs> uh, well, this goes back to, this is Powderfinger on Vulture Street. I was given this um, in 2004 when I first came to Australia from uh, my wife, my date, who was then my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, as I was leaving Australia and she, and she said, well, this summed up our time together. And I'd listened to it for three weeks in Egypt. <laughs> because I didn't embrace the local music, to be honest with you. And uh, I went with Powderfinger and said, so this is a soundtrack to my Australian, soundtrack to my life, and soundtrack to the person that came into my life, and soundtrack that brought me to the Central Coast, even though they're not a Central Coast band. So it's Australian as I get. Yeah. <laughs> Glenn, what did you bring? Um, I brought, actually, a photo of happy, a very happy time of my life. It was my high school graduation with my, my elder sister. And um, I used to dream and talk to her a lot about photography and... Ken was an uncle, so it was always, she was a bit competitive like me, we always want to be better than him and, and do things better and smarter. Um, unfortunately, five years ago, she lost a battle and um, took her own life. And so I carry this with me now and it's a constant reminder that, you know what, I'm going to keep fighting the fight and trying to be the artist that she always, she used to help me a lot with my marketing and all that sort of stuff, so that's, that's why. Thank you. Well, I've brought along everyone's favourite toy from their childhood, Duplo, because I see uh, myself and fellow panellists and groups like the Creative Workshop and Seacup as uh, building the foundations for you know, a vibrant, diverse arts and cultural scene on the coast. So one Duplo block at a time, and we will tower and prevail. We just have to be and we'll graduate until they go. <laughs> that <laughs> was very good. <laughs> <laughs> David. Uh, but I've always been interested in music. And I've always, also, always been interested in technology. And I've always been interested in business models and God knows what. And this from 1904, I think it is, is an example of the first uh, recorded music that was commercially available, uh, made by Edison on a magical plastic called Amberol. Four minutes of music on this. Is that a cylinder? It's a cylinder. And it rotates like this. Yeah. And, you know, this predated the 78. And uh, this, you know, changed so many things. One is it changed music. It changed music as a business. Um, it used the technology of the time. And, you know, what we're seeing today with the net and everything is we're seeing something similar to this in the sense of the distribution models changing. This changed the distribution model of music. Before this, it was pianola sheets.
mm. and sheet music. Suddenly you could hear it on this. And a magical thing on the net is you put, if you put Edison recorded music into Google, you can actually access the first ever recorded music made by Edison. Mm. And I'm actually going backwards now to making music off recorded music isn't viable much these days, so yeah. you rely on the live performance. Yeah, exactly. So it's always changing. Mm. And I think the moment you think things are going to stay the same, mm. you're going to get a big surprise. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Have you actually got the cylinder in there? It's in there. Can't get it out, though. Oh, OK. <laughs> Dory, what did you bring us? Well, I'm uh, proud to say that I've recently discovered Jesus. And, um, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're being facetious or not. He was in an op shop. <laughs> 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 uh, he did I'm, say he'd come back with the central coast. <laughs> well, he's sort of on wheels. I don't know if you can see him. <laughs> I wondered, I wondered if there was a whole box set where I could get, you know, Buddha and, you know, Muhammad and have them in various tableaus, sort of like pushing shopping trolleys in Erin Affair or outside McDonald's, you know, uh, arrange them in certain tableaus. But Jesus action figure. Jesus like action figure. The mind boggles, doesn't it? Oh, an op shop in Woi Woi, so that's my find. Is, it made by the, is, is that from St. Venice? Uh, yes. Oh, um, well, first topic of discussion. In the news at the start, we had the fact that uh, Gosford is planning on building a performing arts centre. There's one already happening at Wyong. There's also one that's just been finished at the Central Coast Grammar School, performing arts centre. What do we feel about all these new performing arts centres popping up everywhere? I'll, I'll start with you, Jessica. <laughs> Look, I think it's fantastic, Phil. Uh, more opportunities for local creatives to have their work seen on the coast could only be a good thing. And also for the Central Coast to become a location for travelling shows of many different types to visit our region. Again, it's a positive. It's a step in the right direction. Mm. Glenn? Yeah, I think it's a great thing. I think the more, um, the more outlets for creatives on the coast, the better. Um, I think there's so many creatives on the coast that uh, it's very hard sometimes to find an outlet that, that you can express yourselves and obviously to get... We have a child that's leaving the room. <laughs> <laughs> and to get more people coming here, it's a, I think it's a great thing. Yeah, Keith, any thoughts? Very much so. I concur with the previous panellists that it's been a long time coming. And certainly I've only been on the coast eight years, but certainly even in the eight years, I think we've been waiting a while and even people have been waiting longer for it. My only, I suppose, caveat that I put to it is that we, if we build it, will they come? I'm really looking at, you know, can we fill those spaces? Well, that's, that's one of the big issues. We're, we're now going to have uh, three, potentially more, rather large capacity venues. We have the Lake Street Theatre currently mm -hmm. and the little theatre down in Woi Woi. Um, but there's not many other places, so this will be a wealth of places for live music, live theatre. Dorian, what's your take as a musician on this? Well, I'm sort of the, on the dark end of the couch here, on the, the sort of cynical side. They've been talking about <laughs> building this performing arts centre, I think, um, since the Ark was going to be built. <laughs> and um, I think really to get it up, they need to combine it with a sports centre, maybe have a cricket cricketing academy inside. Well, they're or putting it right next door to the sports centre. Well, maybe they, they, they need like a tunnel, you know. Tunnel. Like, <laughs> you know, then we'd get it up very quickly. Uh, maybe we could call it the Anzac Sports Centre uh, Arts Hub and uh, we'd, get, we'd get funding straight away. Well, let's say, Matthew, um, you're fairly recent to this day. Would you have any thoughts on this? I, I think the, the idea of calling it the Anzac Arts Centre mm. is, is, is ripper. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sort of on the cynical end of the couch here. But uh, just talking, you know, back there before we came on, um, someone else, I didn't make the point, but it's a lovely point. He said, you know, Central Coast doesn't have a centre, you mm. know, and perhaps these buildings actually give more of a centre to the creative community on the coast. Well, that's one of the reasons I think both Wyoming and Gosford are doing this. But it could, be, it could be too much too soon because mm. they're not going to solve everything. You've actually got to build a greater presence for art and culture in general rather than just build performing arts centres. And we miss, we keep missing the boat, like we miss yeah. the boat on the whole bogan thing. Yeah. You know, like, you know, the bogan shire, I've got the, the giant bogan, you know, the statue you may have heard. You know, we, we, where's our statue? We need a statue of a giant bogan on top of the, the hill as we come up the, the M1. So people can, instead of the dinosaur, we've got a giant bogan the up there. The Central Coast is the bogan capital of Australia. Well, you know, we, 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 we need an identity. We need Chris Holstein. Well, 
didn't say it. But, you know, some kind of, you know, it could be a combined water feature, you know, where it's yeah. sort of urinating out the side or something. Yeah. Some, you know, some kind of... I'm sure Gospel <laughs> Cats will really like that. They'll go for that one. That's, that's, I'm trying that, to get this going. That's, you know? a water, that's, a, that's, a, that's a water fountain. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Combined, you know, enormous statue as you come up the... Come up the M1. I think it's. I think it's got legs. Well, I think we're all basically in agreement that we want these kinds of things. I just hope that if they build it, they will come, as they say. But uh, can I just make a point? You know, yeah. I think the building of these centres, in a way, has to ask the question: Who are they most important to? They're actually of most importance to the council, because it's their way of making a statement without following it through. We've done it. We've got a performing arts centre. We've looked after the arts. Yeah. Move on to something that. else. Yeah, I think that's true. You do risk that they become icons. Yeah, like the, like the Opera House, you know? Well, the opera I've gone without substance. Yeah, the opera, opera House eats up so much of the state art and culture budget, it's untrue. It's about 40% of it. Well, that means we've got to make sure we put on productions that bring the people bring, We've got to bring the people in. Yeah, and and that, professional productions that people, not just the Central Coast, but even from Sydney or Newcastle. Absolutely, that's the point. You've got to pull the people in rather than just build the buildings. Well, this brings us to our next topic, in fact, which is how do you make money on the arts? How, as an artist, do you make a living? How do you put on these kinds of things that attract an audience? And we're going to talk about marketing a little later, in particular. But, Jessica, um, as an artist, as a teacher, <laughs> <laughs> as someone who's trying to support artists in this way, how do you do it? How do you find it? I think uh, of key importance for artists is the ability to diversify. We do have to wear several hats and uh, for an artist to have the ability to explore different markets for their work is essential. It's not enough to be exceptional at your craft. You have to find ways to have a presence in different markets and that means to diversify without becoming the Ken Doan of the art world, although there's nothing wrong with Ken Doan and I will make the point that his paintings still fetch as much as they did uh, before they were on every curtain and bedspread imaginable. But uh, that need to diversify, I would, I would emphasise as being very important. So, so you think artists need to expand their skill set basically? They need to expand their skill set and uh, if you take a step back, what do they need to expand their skill set? Well, they need access to the specialised equipment, the networks and the expertise mm. and they need that locally. Uh, it is important to leave the region uh, as an artist to develop, uh, especially in terms of professional development, but that ability to access the uh, resources and expertise and training locally is really what artists need to be able to have a diverse practice, mm -hmm. to have a professional practice. And we're starting to see that on the Central Coast with some fantastic initiatives. However, more support on the ground to have those resource-rich art centres that can support robust and sustainable arts practice is what I'd like to see. Well, Glenn, you've, uh, you've been successful as a photographer and an artist. You're making a living at this, I presume. Yep. And you're running a couple of other businesses that are related to what you do. So how have you managed to pull that off? Well, that's one thing I think Jess said, diversification is the key. I've got a printing and framing company, mm. a gallery and a photography tour business mm. because I, I, I'm working towards sustaining just one. Mm. Um, and I think the big thing with artists, and I'll talk about photography more so than art, but with photography, I think nowadays people have become very lazy. And I'll say that generally, people are lazy. They think, oh, I can be a photographer, I can just do it because I put photos on Facebook and 800 people liked it. Yeah. Well, who gives a flying who really? I mean, that doesn't <laughs> get you money, okay? So I think with photography, particularly, people need to get a backbone. And if they want to do photography, then mm. have a vision, have a dream and chase it. Mm. So, and, and that's, that's what I've done. I've tried every which way to make money in this industry. And the only way you can is, is to get your product right, mm. market it well and just believe that you can do it. Yeah. Well, make, I, mean, I was just going to say, I mean, you're dead right, you've got to have a business model. Um, and actually the question is not how artists make money, but how do artists make more money? And how do they make more sustainable, consistent money? And to actually diversify in that way, so you're using your skill set in a way where you sell stuff that's beyond just being an artist or a photographer and so on. I mean, it's a, a lovely model. For, for other people to think about. Yeah, well, we created an ecosystem yeah. that, that yeah, funnels exactly. itself, so I think it's, it's a better fantastic. way to operate. And that's so, the thing these days, every artist needs to make their own little ecosystem, and there's lots of tangential things you can bring into that, uh, whether it be teaching, whether it be crowdsourcing, whatever it is yeah. that you can do to you know, continue as an artist of some kind. Uh, what's well, your take on this story? Well, I 
again, I'm you're probably the fly on the ornament here, but I say to, say to people if they want to be in the arts, especially young people, don't be in the arts. So I say... That's every parent's good advice. That's what I say to people. <laughs> I say, if you, if you think you'd like to be an actor or if you think you'd like to be a painter, don't do it. If you have to be a painter or you have to be an artist, that's when you do it. And, and I'm, I, I can't do anything else. You know, it's kind of more like a calling. It's sort of more akin to sort of the priesthood or whatever. You know, it's a, it's a calling you have because, you know, I'd like to think that if I kept that job at Kmart, I might be regional man, manager of the Woi Woi store by now. You know, $110,000 a year and a company car and, you know, an aspidistra in the corner. I'd be quite happy. Yeah, would you <laughs> it's be a crap happy life. Though, would you? Well, I think most people would. I, I wouldn't be happy. Um, because I'm driven to, to do something else. I can't, I've tried to do those sorts of things and I can't do them. So I always say to people, um, and I think it's healthy to say that to people because it is a tough road. And I think if you say, look, if you think, you, if you think it might be interesting to be you know, a full-time musician, that's your answer, don't do it. But if that's just what you have to do, and you know those people that are driven and they have to do mm. that, that's what they have to do. They have to be a writer, they have to. And you, like your man over here, you'll find a way to make a living out of it. You will just find a way to do it. You'll push through. And there's no, there's no sort of regular sort of career ladder. You know, it's not like you sort of, you do this with the bank and then you get the next job. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's maddening because, you know, it's three steps forward, two steps back. But if you're really passionate about it, you're driven and you have this passion for the arts, which most of the people here do, I'd say, mm. that's, when you, that's when you do it. But if you kind of think you'd like to do it, then... Yeah. Well, there was a study, I remember, I forget who did it, but that artists of all kinds, creative people, tend to be the least well-paid, but the happiest in their world. That's actually a really important point, because your managers at Kmart, and your bankers and so on, and those sort of studies, come out as rather unhappy people. Because well, they're operating yeah. on sterile tram lines all the time. But what we're asking now is we're asking artists not to be artists. But certainly in terms of the funding that I do with, with yeah. crowdfunding and grants, now you have to have a business development component on top of your artistry. Mm. So now you're asking for another skill set outside that ecosystem again, which is where we struggle with artists basically you say, look, we, are, we admire your artistic integrity, but now we're going to ask you to do something completely different as well, which put forward a business case and mm. program rationale and evaluation and audit and budgets. Do you do on top that, of this? Do you do that with them? Yes, we do. Right. Well, let's we talk do. about this. So you, you do you run workshops to help artists um, sustain an artistic business and also to apply for grants that will help them. So, what exactly do you do, and how do you get them the money? So the grants guy, we do three predominant features, which is we do hold grants workshops, we do grants calendars for artists, so showing them dictatively what's coming up that they can apply for, and we help them with the grants process, which was appraising, assessing, and reviewing their application before it goes in, and then we can help them with their reporting processes and an end them to that as well. Okay. But the knowledge base out there isn't there for artists, obviously. Other grants don't know where the grants are, the artists don't know where the grants are, and don't know how to apply for the grants at the end of the day, basically. So we help them in those three primary facets. And you're looking at grants from local, state, federal, and Correct. private bodies, everything that's out there. Yeah, bequests, donations, bursaries, scholarships, private funding, public funding. So what more do you realise? There's a lot out there and it's also about getting people to give on the coast and outside of the coast as well, that people can actually understand that bequests, scholarships, donations, they can set up. They can set up their own private trust to give money basically to an Is artistic it, integrity. In America there's a bit of a culture yeah. of patronage of the arts. Do we have much of that here? No. no. This is the ironic thing again. We were voted number one as a country in the World Giving Index in 2012, which means we're fantastic up here when it comes to bushfires, tsunamis and floods. And at the other end of the scale, we're fantastic at the Bunnings barbecue and the gold coin donation, mm. but in the middle, we're abject. Mm. So we don't have the philanthropic mindset to the same degree as America or the UK about giving back to the arts. Mm. And we no, need I to condition us more. Yeah, so I should say, this show itself received a grant. We got a grant from Arts Central to help put this show on. Um, you received the same grant, Dorian, recently mm. uh, from Arts Central. Uh, Jessica, you've also received some grants in your time, haven't you? That's right, we received a community development grant from Gosford Council which enabled a creative workshop to deliver its pilot project and we've built from the momentum of that original injection of cash so it can be critically important for an idea to, to form. Uh, Glenn, have you ever received any grant money? I'm a bit slow on the uptake on that one. No, <laughs> I did it the dumb way or the hard way but I will be touching base because I'm, no, I, I've done everything just by working hard. So. We wear oh. so many different hats, don't we, artists, yeah. as we touched on before. Now, now we have to be grant, grant savvy as well. 
Yeah, and there's a whole process, as you know, to... Well, the, the question is... Very much so. The question is, can you expect the artist to have those skills? You know, that's where I'm interested in your role, because, you know, that's sort of... What Arts New South Wales and yeah. Regional Arts New South Wales do expect you to have that skill set yeah, of yeah. innovation, creativity and sustainability yeah. when it yeah. comes to your practice because they see you as a business model. Mm. They see you as a business as much as an artist. Mm. So that's where artists, I think, that's where I have had a lot of, a lot of talks and discussions with artists to say, I, again, I appreciate your artistic integrity, but you're also a business. It's mm. Is that what we're really talking about? <laughs> artists should think of themselves as a business if they want to earn a living, uh, sustain career doing what they do. Well, the creativity must come first, then comes the business mm. at yeah. the end of the day. But that's the practical economics of it at the end of the day. And, and grants are geared for a reason at the end of the day. They're an economic investment by government on taxpayers' money. So mm. they have to have value for money principles. Mm. And for the private sector, they operate off the acronym WEFM, which is what's in it for me. <laughs> Dory, have you received a grant before this one? Um, not really. I've, I've found it's, this is probably the, one of the first grants I've received. I've found it very difficult to get grants if you're sort of a white working class guy from Gosford, you, no, people aren't really <laughs> that interested in your story. And he has and, a point. And you I'm have... afraid it's true. Yes, yeah. um, I'm yep. lucky that Gosford Council, Wine Council, we should mention Wine Council too, who supported our us because mm -hmm. um, they kind of realised what we were talking about was identity. This is, this is, this is a project in identity. Our, our Bogan Song Cycle is, is an exploration of identity. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of acknowledged that, which blew me away really. But I wouldn't have got that grant without, I must acknowledge Margaret Mee and our producer because she's the person that did all the grants application because my partner and I, he's a very clever guy. He, he wrote Tap Dogs, he wrote the music for Tap Dogs. But he just works as a chippy on the Central Coast. That's how he makes money. He's a, he'll come and fix your pool deck and unblock your toilet and you know. Well, that's and, and he wrote Tap Dogs. You know, reliable. So. <laughs> he's good, you want his car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Artists like this of this caliber having to resort to doing a very different kind of work just to, to make a living, unfortunately. Um, but it's a very good point that you make because even if we go on the Arts New South Wales website and look at the grants that are about to open up in May of this year, mm. there's a focus on cultural linguistic diversity, Aboriginality, being from Western Sydney, being from regional yeah. New South Wales, mm. all right, and right? working with people with an intellectual disability. So at least we qualify for the regional ones. If you're not well, we don't. We're no, not no, a regional. We're not regional. We're not regional enough. Regional? We're right. too That's close to Sydney. It's not, it's not metropolitan, it's not regional, it's not quite anything. It's stuck in the middle there, yeah. isn't it? This is one of the discussions we've been having. Mm -hmm. Let me wrap this up. One more topic I want to talk about primarily is marketing side of things. So I'll start with you, David. How should um, an artist of any kind really look at marketing themselves? Well, I think, I think there's <coughs> a hell of a lot of issues involved in this. And I think the primary issue is that um, I don't believe, personally, um, that the, the artist should rely solely on the public purse. I think the private purse, the business purse or whatever, is just as important and probably more sustainable to relying on grants and so on. Um, so the marketing, I think, of art should be both to the community and to the general public and to the local council. And I think then you begin to get a sustainable model. And if the public as well, through activities, begin to believe that art and culture is really important or can be really important in the Central Coast, then everything else will work better. I mean, the more people employed <coughs> in the creative industries than there are in mining, you know? Um, but there's an imbalance, you know, 8.7%, I think it is, of people in the eastern half of Sydney are in creative industries. Up here, it's 1.9, right? Mm. And I went around the HSC... And most of that 1.9 go to Sydney to do their work. Absolutely. And I went around the HSC exhibition at the Regional Art Gallery the other week. week. And some of the work was absolutely superb. And I left with a sadness because I knew most of those kids, right, would actually move to Sydney, mm. you know? So if there's sort of more, and I don't think it, it's performing arts centres, I don't think it's that, but I think if there's more appreciation of art and culture up here, then particularly from the business community, money will flow. Do you feel there's a, there's a lack of a culture on the coast that promotes the arts? I think the culture could be more visible. Yeah, I think, I think it's a healthy culture. Yeah. Um, I think opportunities for it to be visible, uh, visible yeah. uh, could be more numerous. That's my take on it. I think it's changing. I think slowly it's changing. Yeah, I've, it I've been on the coast about eight or nine years and I've seen a definite shift in the type of people that are a, coming mm. here to holiday, which is increasing the awareness in the arts. And I think um, 
the people that have started to move into the areas have started to really increase mm. that that appreciation mm. of art. I, I, I think, think what sorry. Yeah. Right. I think one thing that's been massive up here is the public art that's been going up because it's created yeah. debate and conversation. I mean, sometimes you know, with local chambers of commerce, they refer to it as graffiti, but people find it really interesting. God, I haven't I done that well, and so on. And that alone begins to elevate creativity. Very simple thing to do. Well, you've managed to market yourself very well. Um, how, how did you learn that? You know, I had a guy come in today, he was 19 years old, and he's done a bit of work for me. And he's a brilliant photographer, but he's got five companies. He calls them companies. They're, <laughs> they're running all in photography, but tiny little genres off each one. He's trying to diversify, he's trying to do the right thing. And he's going out and he's going to buy this other piece of equipment that's a total and utter waste of money and it's going to cost him four or five thousand dollars and he said what should i do and i said you know what you should do get the four or five thousand dollars and go and do a business marketing degree because anyone out there at the moment mm. can take the photos art's different but photography they can go and take the photos i can buy a three thousand dollar camera so can anyone else camera is not the point of difference so how do i market myself to answer it um it, it's multifaceted at the moment. I've got Instagram accounts, 500 Pix accounts, Facebook accounts, Flickr accounts, across multiple businesses that you have to be interacting with people now. So I think like years ago where you mm. buy a full page ad in a magazine and away you go, those mm. days are finished. Oh You've got a Google AdWords campaigns, Facebook ad campaigns. It's, it's a lot of work and research and upskilling. It's and you keep up with all of this? I have yourself? to. I have to. I'm the I'm the marketer. I'm the CEO. I'm the pain in the ass boss. That's the problem. <laughs> and that's what we get to. Like is yeah. exactly what you're saying. Is it's you you, you lose all your time to be creative because you spend. I got seven staff, so I spend so much time trying to keep a business afloat that you have very little time to actually do what you what you want to do. Is so. this something you touch on in your workshops, Kate? Yeah, very much so. That it's now integral with grants that you have to market yourself beforehand and even afterwards as well because people can only help you if they know you exist, profile, mm. profile, profile. So you have to sell the grant before you even apply for the grant and then when you get the grant you have to sell the grant all over again to justify the funding. Mm. So it's a vicious circle basically <laughs> and it's understanding like you're saying that even if I'm a singular artist or a singular entity I should be using social media to best effect and mm. I should be out there promoting who I am and what I'm doing not just for purveyors of the arts basically and coming here but for the funding body as well because they want to see that at the end of the day you have to know how to market yourself. Mm. One of the first things we did when setting up the litmus test was the Facebook page, the website, the Twitter account, all of that kind of stuff which is still growing. Dorian, how do you handle marketing yourself as a sole you know, person out there? You don't have a staff working for you. No, well I don't have a staff apart from myself. Um, I, find, I find that very challenging. Um, it's changed a lot since I started playing music and writing books and things years ago. I mean, I don't, I'm not on Facebook, you know, I mean, you can follow me around the streets. Oh, that's it, I'm, I'm you know. Look for yeah, you yeah, there. you know, I'm, I'm nowhere, but... Um, so how do people get to like you? Well, exactly. See, I'm one of these old-fashioned people that, like, if I like someone, I actually like someone. And I find there's a real disingenu disingenuous quality about mm. Facebook where, am I liking this person because I want to put them on a list so they can come to my gig? And I struggle with that, you know. Mm. And so my answer to that is I've never been on Facebook. And everyone says, oh, well, you know, you've got to, if you're a musician, you've got to be on Facebook. And, you know, I... That used I, to be MySpace. Used to be MySpace. <laughs> yeah, what, there's one person, I think, on MySpace at the moment. Well, it's his space. Yeah, exactly. Well, his space. Very good. So, I, yeah, I, I... Look, to be honest with you, I'm crap at it. Um, and if I was any better at it, I'd be um, a lot more well-known. But um, some people are very good at it, but are pretty ordinary artists mm. so I I don't know uh, some people are good at it and good artists and that's so. fun, trying to find the balance enough time yeah. and effort to put into your art yeah. to become good at it and to be able to market yourself and, and that's, yeah. hard, that's hard work it's hard it's yeah. hard work I mean um, we've been lucky with the grant um, we've had some we've for the first time in our lives we've actually had a, a few shekels to kind of earmark for marketing which mm. has been great which has been bizarre really and Madge our producer Margaret Mean, she's been She's been a great uh, influence for us because she's very, been very professional. She was a producer on the movie show for SBS oh, okay. for years, yeah. and she lives at Woi Woi, and um, and she's she's sort of running the business side of. So we we're allowed to be creative, and that's been a first for us. We've actually been able. Well, to... Well, that that becomes one of the things. It, it costs money. 
to market yourself and most artists don't have the money to spare for that. Well I mean on the other, on the other hand, you know, um, you know, the age of social media has enabled artists to mm. market themselves very affordably and it is a great way to, to build networks. Uh, it's been a really um, useful tool for the creative workshop certainly. Mm. Um, I think used the right way, it, it, it can be you know, a really useful tool for artists to yeah. profile themselves and, and build their networks. I, th I think with social, um, sorry, I think with social media though, there's an issue, and that is that you can't stick something up and expect people to come to it. No. You've got to build a profile first. You need to, you need to have quality content and regular Quality content, updates, and then eventually you can sell. That's right. Mm. That's you spend right. all your time trying to sell yourself. And yeah. We've got a few questions actually from the audience here. So I'm going to throw to Peter, who's in the audience, and we have our first question from one of our audience members. Peter. We do, we do indeed, and I'd like to thank the panel for being so, uh, so wonderful and informative and, and humorous as well. Um, we've got Erin here, who has some experience with funding, I believe, and I, I, I think she's going to um, have an interesting question for us. Hi, guys. Um, so we touched briefly. I can't remember your name. Keith. Keith, hi. Hi. Um, you talked... You, like you said the word crowdfunding like with a split second and um, I just wanted to bring it back up because I think it's fairly new but it's so effective and I'd love to I guess put it to you guys what you think of crowdfunding I actually work for a crowdfunding platform so <laughs> feel free which to one? ask me questions yeah, I'll start some good right. oh, yeah. um, for social good um, projects oh. so yeah we actually here at the Rhythm Hut um, did a very successful Start Some Good crowd, crowdfunding campaign. Raised over 25 grand in three weeks. Well done. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll start off. I think it depends on the offering. You know, some offerings for crowdfunding campaigns have a lot more traction than others. Mm. And we see some campa campaigns take off because often it's something tangible mm. that the supporter takes home with it, whether it's a techie gadget or whatnot. And for, for other uh, causes, the, uh, you know, the, the benefits are less tangible. And marketing that, that cause successfully requires uh, the individual to be a bit more savvy. And uh, I don't know what, what the other panellists think about, about that. Well, I don't, I don't like crowdfunding. <laughs> <laughs> more, hard figure, more, more, cynic, more cynical from the dark side of the couch, you know. Maybe because I've had no power for a week, I'm calling myself the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> <laughs> As we record this, we're still recovering from a week's worth of blackout in the region. Yeah, but suddenly we we'll, suddenly we'll lose our power, you'll know what's happened in the podcast. Um, I worry about uh, crowdfunding in terms of... Um, other funding, like I, I donate money to, to uh, a mob called Kiva who do these small loans mm. to the third world, mm. which is fantastic, mm. little fishing villages and different things. And, and, it, and it's, really, it's a really rewarding thing. And I worry about if that coin is, is, is sort of being taken away from some of those people that just don't have houses. And, mm. you know, yeah, well, you could crap. argue that Kiva is a form of crowdfunding. Yeah, but it, to the for the third world, you know, I think. Well, yeah, well, a lot of the, fun, a lot of the causes that we have on Start Some Good are actually for things like in Cambodia or... Yeah, I'm all for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm being in terms of arts crowdfunding. For instance, a friend of mine who should remain totally nameless um, made a CD uh, that no one will ever listen to, um, but he crowdfunded and he got $10,000, which is great. But I just, I just worry about that coin, whether that's now detracting from, you know, in, um, like I teach at Naysdale and Indigenous College, um, we, need, we need funding, uh, we always need money for yeah. Naysdale. You know, I just wonder if that coin's getting taken away from those causes and, and kind of funding a lot of lot of things that normally wouldn't actually get funded. I don't know. I think the thing, um, I see what you're saying. Mm. Um, I guess the thing is, though, with crowdfunding, it's not like you're donating 10 grand in one pot, every person. It's like every person's giving $5 or $15 or 25 which, you know, for most of us who, you know, live on the Central Coast, we've got a decent income, so that's mm. not heaps of money. And it's mostly... Um, your network as well so it's like your mom and your cousin and mm. your <laughs> dance teacher and you know anybody who wants to support you so essentially like mm. you know you're, you're kind of um, valuizing, evaluating well, one, like, yeah. your network. One thing about crowdfunding is it, it has democratized in that if you want to invest in the art and a particular artist you can do it directly you don't have to go through the record company or the film studio or wherever it is if you want to support this artist you can do it directly mm. and uh, the most successful crowdfunding things have been tech product, yeah. and in the arts, 
this musician's doing CDs for like $10,000. Mm. Uh, one of the toughest ones is film, which is my particular area of interest, because it's so expensive. Because you need so much money. Yeah, yeah. And it's sure. hard to get that. The highest thing for a film has been a couple of million dollars, and that's from high profile people. But from crowdfunding, it. it's it, coming back to your previous point, it's offered choice to people where they didn't have it before about having this singular interest that I can have now have a choice of what I want to fund rather than being told I have to fund something. Yeah. Mm. And secondly, then it's giving me basically opportunities that value add to participate in things I've never had an opportunity mm. before. So with the film opportunities, now people are being offered extra roles or walk on roles or talking roles, depending on the value yeah, of their the contribution, mm. the benefits yeah. of it. And we saw Eskimo Joe, who fundraised or complete or crowdfunded or crowdsourced their whole Rita's, uh, latest album mm. and the person who made the highest donation that came and played the album live in their living room oh really <laughs> wow. so as it, it is yeah. it's amazing so it, it's it, having it, becomes, it com becomes a whole interaction a whole relationship and that's what it's about that's the principle just, of crowdfunding rather than just being dollars and cents yeah. you're part of the evolutionary process of the yeah. art yeah. that that artist is actually initiating well one of the yeah. issues maybe you can speak to this is, is the legal ramification we don't quite know legally what kind of investment this is so yeah. by some of the... It's a donation. Basically. Well, in the strictest terms, basically, yeah, it, until people want to claim it back, obviously, at the end of the day, uh, as a taxable donation. Uh, we have possible Kickstarter, Indiegogo, where they obviously stipulate that there's going to be up to a 9% levy that they will charge as part of your donations or the That's cumulative amount. That's their fee to absorb it. Now, they'll pay all the taxes on everything else that's there, strictly speaking, as a donation. But does, the legal ramifications are still there because, number one, plagiarism is still rife in crowdfunding mm. on projects. And number two, that basically the legality isn't, there, isn't being put there by the Commonwealth government as of yet. So they're still looking into that mm -hmm. as to whether there can be any dis, you know, uh, discrepancy there when it comes to the funding. It's basically a protection for investors so that if they do invest in a bogus um, mm. project, there's a way of getting their money back. So up to now, the crowdfunding sites have promised to pay that back if something's proven That's to right. be bogus. Mm. Yeah. But they can't do that too often. So it's basically run on trust at yeah. the, a lot of it. And for the most part, it works. Yes. I think, especially for smaller projects. At the moment. Yes. Right. Oh. The moment a system gets abused, it can bad, good money can yeah. be driven out by bad money very easily. That's right. And there's a, an argument there that yeah. it's actually reached its peak, yeah. basically, when it comes to the human interest element in it. And now we even have universities actually using it for research. Yeah. So they're getting funding for research because yeah, Gonski's made all their money Gonski. So really, <laughs> they have no money anymore. So they're now crowdfunding research. Yeah. We see Monash University doing this yeah, as I've a actually, case in point. Yeah, but I've actually spoken to the GI Cancer Institute about doing a crowdfunding campaign for their research into GI cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's lots of... Um, and I think that what they see in it is that it's immediate. Yeah. It's not like, okay, well, I have to go to you know, this person who knows about finance, who can help me with um, working out my finances so I can apply for a loan, which I'm going to have to pay back. And that process itself, as you know, is so long. And, um, you know, if it's something immediate, they need mm. it, you know, mm. they need it now or close to now. <laughs> and um, so I think it's, I, th I am a huge fan of it, obviously. Um, but I, th I think it's, I, I don't think it's reached saturation. I think it's reached a new wave, to be honest, because as we said, the, the Pebble smartwatch, I think, just raised 20 million, which is the biggest um, amount of money that has been raised in well, crowdfunding. We, yeah, we've got... Pebble smartwatch. You know, the Pebble smartwatch. Oh. Yeah. Yes, oh, okay. and that's, I mean, but when you think about... Yeah. But the biggest one that we've had is the ASRC. The ASRC, you're talking about um, artists coming to people's houses. Gautier actually mm -hmm. partnered with the ASRC and one of the... Um, rewards was he would come and do a, uh, a concert in your house, which mm. <laughs> so is really fun. So I think that it's a great way of involving high profile people. It's a great mm. way of um, giving people a reward for donating and also, you know, keeping them involved in the process. Mm. Well, bringing it back to the arts, I think where we need to look at in terms of crowdfunding is now we have local government and state government in Europe, America, Canada and the UK crowdfunding projects crowdfunding arts projects. And of course, crowdfunding, if you're here based on the Central Coast or wherever, mm. it's the whole world, potentially, that can be yeah, 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 yeah. it. And it doesn't cost much to get it going, to set it up. It doesn't cost anything, really, yeah. Yeah. apart from a couple of hours. So where local government have said it's not within their budget parameters to fund this arts project, they put it out to tender, per yeah. se, mm. to the general public. One of the highest ones is a couple of hundred thousand dollars for an artistic piece in the States, in Utah. Really? Um, and it's been done in the UK, it's been done in Canada, as I said. Yeah. Holland is very prominent in this as well, for where it's not in the <laughs> artist budget 
of the local or state government entity. They put it out and people have reciprocated on a 50-50 funding model. Mm -hmm. But even getting that to work, and I have to wrap this discussion up, mm -hmm. is marketing it. Yeah. Making that crowdfunding cycle. Yeah. When you make that pitch initially, to make the video, to make mm -hmm. to market it and really sell yeah. the idea to want people to invest. Yeah, I want to see this done. Yeah. People will give their money for that. Thank you, excellent question. Thank you. Um, we are going to wrap this up, so I'm just going <laughs> back around. Um, Dorian, where can we find out about the Bogan Song Cycle? You can go to the bogansongcycle.com.au, but yeah. there are some dates uh, on there. Um, we're playing various venues around the Central Coast. And in fact, Red. your next gig is coming up Friday the 8th of May at Woi Woi. The Spiritual Home. <laughs> Where about? And you're playing at Make, the Lake Munmore, the entrance of Oak and Wyoming. Um, not all at the same time. Well, no. <laughs> but uh, we are, yes, the we're Peninsula Theatre with the Don Craig Room, and it's exciting because we're, we're, it's a show about the coast. It's a show, all, the songs are all about the Central Coast, and it's ex explorations of identity, and we read things out of tabloid magazines about diets and all the stuff that mm -hmm. people talk about. That's and we didn't, we didn't show it there, but you actually do a little introduction for each song, and you give us a story yeah, behind each yeah, song and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so have a look at the website, guys. Uh, the, what's, the, what's the website again? The bogansongcycle.com. Bogansongcycle.com. Look it up, and see if you can get along. Uh, you got Thank anything you. to promote? You. Nope. <laughs> not, at the moment, no. not at the moment, myself. Basically, basically C cups. Are you selling a free market? Exactly. Selling C cups. Exactly. Selling a free car or anything? Uh, Jessica, where can uh, we get in touch with you? Info, uh, info at creativeworkshop.org.au or www.creativeworkshop.org.au. Okay. Um, I'll do a You Heard It Here first, but I've got a. In going along that theme, I, I uh, came up with an idea a little while ago. I've been working on to do an exhibition on the Central Coast. Uh, but being a photographer trying to do di something different, I decided to do one from the air looking down. So we've got a helicopter that we've used Whoa. to basically photograph the entire Central Coast from the sky looking down. Uh, it's called Above the Coast and it'll be on starting the 29th of May, going for two weeks. So that, um, that'll be in our gallery at Erina, um, or you can just check on my website, which is just glennmckimmon.com, and find it there. Okay, thanks, Glenn. And uh, Keith, anything to push? Anything to spruik? The Grants Guy. Yeah, what's the website? <laughs> Thegrantsguy.com.au. Very the simple, short, the concise, name? to the point, just like a good grant <laughs> application. So if you need to, some help putting together a grant, applying for a grant, grantsguy.com.au. That's it. Okay. Brilliant. Um, we, uh, the Rhythm Hunters are coming up to close the show, but before that, we have another package to show you. One thing we're going to do on this show is um, we're going to profile a local legend in each show. Uh, someone who's worked here uh, for the arts on the coast for many years or is very prominent in their field. Our first one that we're going to show you is Margaret Hardy. Hello, welcome to this special interview for the litmus test with Margaret Hardy. Hello, Margaret. Hello and welcome. How did you get involved in arts in this region? Well, I'd had eight years at Mount Martha in Victoria and I was very enthralled with the new Frankston Gallery that was built just before I, I left there. And this was in the mid 70s. And I came up here and I was looking for art classes and exhibition galleries and what have you and there was very little around so I became, joined the Art Society and found that they hadn't got very far. How did you find the Art Society? I went to an exhibition at the Kincumber School of Arts and I think I made a complaint to the girl on the desk and she said well if you feel like that and strongly enough you come along and join. So I started to write to the newspapers and say, why isn't there facilities for the arts? And from that, my whole life changed because everybody wanted to know me because uh, everybody had been sitting back waiting for somebody else to do it, mm -hmm. as we all do sometimes. So then we finally made a decision unanimously that we would go for an art centre at Caroline Bay. Now, that stirred up a lot of things because some people didn't want it at Caroline Bay even though it was set aside and dedicated and zoned for a, uh, an art centre. Was there any kind of facilities up to that point on the coast? No, no. So 
G Gosford Musical Society used to have their concerts at the race court, at the showground. Um, there were no, nothing much happening at all. Anyhow, we finally got it through that uh, it go to Caroline Bay, and of course then one of the councillors or the then mayor said no, he wanted it in Gosford, so we were back to square one. So th that had a big emphasis on where we went. We rallied the people around and everybody wanted it at Caroline Bay, but it was also the largest piece of land that council owned. One of the uh, councillors had been working with Price Waterhouse to sell the land for a canal development. Did you expect you were going to get involved in all this political no. toing and froing when you started, I just want to support the art on the coast? No, <laughs> no it was an intriguing and very big learning curve because you had to be thinking from their point of view and saying, no, that's not what we want. This is what the community wants because I had a picture in my head that I wanted a gallery that was in a beautiful location with lovely parklands around it so that um, the whole community could benefit from it. I was so pleased that we finally won that battle. Some of the councillors had to be dragged by their hair into doing it, and now they're the greatest supporters of it. You know, they, and this is why you set up the multi-arts confederation? That, that was why we set it up, to get everybody on side, but also to let council know how many groups there were and what was happening in the arts, because they wouldn't have a clue. You can see now, what's, what are they pushing in Gosford? Football. <laughs> Which is fine, everybody needs, we need a balance of football and sports and and all this but you look at the papers you're not getting much art stuff but you certainly are getting football. That's the political aspect of your career and your, mm -hmm. your journey here on the coast. Uh, you are an artist yourself? I was an artist. What, what did you do? I used to do oil paintings and watercolours um, but unfortunately I had a one of my sons was in a hit and run accident and that took an awful lot out, out of me and my family because my husband was sick also so um, I gave up painting to be a full-time arts administrator, I suppose you'd call me, or a stirrer, <laughs> as some people call me. An advocate. An advocate, <laughs> yes, for the arts. So what do you think are the battles still ahead of us? What are the challenges we have now? I think we still have to get a performing arts space, and I'm on the friends of the performing arts. Gosford needs to be proud to have not only Laycock Street and, and the art gallery, it needs to have a performing art space with proper acoustics because we have some wonderful musicians living here. Are you optimistic about the future for arts of all kinds on the coast here? Definitely. There are so many talented people coming in. Uh, I think the arts will just grow. And you plan to keep on agitating for oh. as long as you can? <laughs> Yes, you get tired every now and again, especially when you get a few knockbacks and you think, is it worth it? You know, and then you think, yes, it is worth it.
Let's go.